That being said, we're going to get rolling. Here we are again with coffee with the founder. I got my coffee cup, got my coffee ready to roll. And of course, we got another phenomenal guest, a friend, colleague, a true sister, in fact, oh. here with us today, and uh, Robin D'Angelo. Robin, we're doing these coffee talks as a way to introduce people to the WPC family, uh, my network of friends and colleagues, and letting folks know just who the good people are that come to the conference, but also the work they do beyond the conference. So let's start by just asking you to introduce yourself. Who are you? How would you introduce yourself or how do you introduce yourself when you meet people? Well, let me say first, it is an honor to be having coffee with you. Um, I went to my first WPC, it was Springfield, Mass. What year was that? Do you know? That would have been 2008. Eight, I believe, or nine, somewhere in there. Okay, so what, 12, 12 years or so ago, and that was it. I was hooked, I was committed. Um, it was phenomenal, um, exciting. I have connections today with people that I have the deepest love and respect for, and most of them come out of WPC, so thank you. Um, I guess I would say that I am um, an academic, uh, a former professor who now full-time writes and speaks uh, on issues of racial justice with a particular focus on a whiteness, um, how white people are shaped by racism and how white people inadvertently uh, uphold racism. So I'm wondering like, how do you define whiteness, right? Like I'm assuming teaching at the college level, you may have some students who are coming to your class with some familiarity, with some knowledge, but by and large, I think people are still not sure what that means. So how do you define that? Yeah, I kind of have to start with white supremacy, which, which we know is a, is a charged term for lots of folks. Um, uh, as a sociologist, I, it, we see it as a highly descriptive uh, sociological term for the society we live in, a society which elevates white people as the uh, human ideal and the norm for humanity. And everyone else is a version and a deficient version of that ideal. And when I'm doing this in a class or presentation, I show um, the image of the Sistine Chapel, God creating man. For me, it is just a clear example of white supremacy. God is white, man is white, you know, the ultimate human. Um, and, and I would add for anybody who feels upset by that term, Right? Like, oh, do, do you have to use that term? That it's actually on that person to get up to date uh, with, with how it gets used today. Because certainly I grew up in a time where it meant people in white hoods. And, and people who react strongly are thinking about it in that way. And it certainly includes that, but it's the whole spectrum, right? So when you hear people like you and I using that term, that should be a clue to you that you're missing something not Eddie and I, right? Mm -hmm. So white supremacy, white as the human ideal, and whiteness is all of the dynamics and dimensions and practices and policies that uphold that. That's kind of like the water of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. The everyday taken for granted um, processes that continually elevate white people above every other kind of person. Mm -hmm. Now, your book, though, is titled White Fragility. Now, is white supremacy, whiteness synonymous with white fragility? How, are, how is that different? Kind of the result. So I think about it like layers, right? So we have white supremacy here, and then whiteness comes out of that. And the result, of course, is white a privilege, advantage for white people. And then I think what I've added is, and then white fragility is what erupts when any of that is named or questioned, mm -hmm. right? And so white fragility is, the, fra the fragility part is meant to capture how little it takes to cause white people to melt down, right? Simply generalizing about white people will cause white people to melt down, right? Um, but the impact of that meltdown isn't fragile at all. It's incredibly powerful because it marshals behind it the weight of legal authority and institutional control. And so it functions as a way to kind of police people of color back into their place, which is not to question my place. 
right? Um, because we make it so miserable uh, for people of color to challenge us, to name this, uh, that most of the time, and you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, you choose not to, right? It's like, it's not worth it. I got to go home today. I got to take care of my family. Uh, odds are things are going to get worse for me, not better, if I try to talk to these white folks about what I'm experiencing here, the whiteness that they're perpetrating. Uh, it tends to actually get worse for people of color. There's more punishment. Uh, and this is, of course, it's a very effective way to keep you from doing that, right? Um, so I think it's just a result of being raised, but, oh, there's kind of like a several threads. One is internalized superiority, uh, which I'm going to make a case no white person avoids, uh, avoids can, can be exempt from internalizing the message that it's better to be white. Actually, nobody avoids that message. The impact is different, of course, whether you are white or not. But very early children know it's better to be white. So I have internalized a sense of superiority. Now, another thread is that I can't admit that because that would mean I was not a good person, right? So you, now you're going to get defensiveness and denial. <laughs> then you're going to get individualism, this very precious belief that we're all unique and special and different and that I could, I could have been exempt from all of that conditioning. And so now I'm going to get my back up because you don't know me and you don't know how I'm different from other white people. And then there's universalism, which is kind of the opposite. Individualism says, why can't we all just be different? And universalism says, why can't we all be the same? And we use them interchangeably. I don't know if you ever noticed. White people, we will use whatever we need to use to get racism off the table. <laughs> so we can move in and out. Um, but it's kind of a complex stew I think about it as a stew roiling inside white people that makes us irrational. This is the great irony, right? Uh, we position ourselves as the objective arbiters of whether your claims of racism are real or not. And yet we're so irrational on race and we're so invested in the racist status quo. We are the ones uh, who play the race card <laughs> and it's called the no race. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you're talking and being someone who's known and been a part of your work and collaboration with you and your work, it's just helpful again to be reminded of the complexity, the layers, oh, yeah. ins and outs. But what I'm wondering is how long did it take for you to get a kind of vision around this? And I was going to ask you about young people. Um, I mean, I'm wondering if parents ask you how early should I start in reference to talking to my kids about these topics. So can you tell us first about your journey to this clarity, this visual, this understanding, and then your advice to parents in reference to introducing their kids, how old, how young, so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, I feel like for white people, it's a lot like water dripping on a rock. You know, just um, because every moment that I have tried to push away from it, push it away, the messages of white supremacy, they're coming right back at me. So I can never be complacent. I will never arrive. Um, and this is one of the challenges of a lot, of a lot of white progressives is we, you know, oh yeah, I'm down, I'm done. Um, and that's very dangerous, right? Um, so it takes years of sustained, uh, study, struggle, relationship building, mistake making, uh, research, you know, it's a, it's a lifelong commitment. Now it's fantastically transformative and liberating and wonderful <laughs> uh, and painful, but I, I, um, I say that so that people don't, oh my God, it sounds so difficult. It, it's, it's liberating to start from the premise that of course I've been thoroughly conditioned into white supremacy. So I can stop defending, denying, debating, and just get to work trying to figure out, okay, how is this conditioning that I got, I could not avoid getting, how's it manifesting in my life, my work, and my relationships? So you change the question from, if I've been shaped by racism, which most white people will answer no, to how have I been shaped 
Mm. And the, how you answer those two things drives your action. Because if the answer is no, I haven't, what further action is required of you? Nothing. Great. Carry on, you know, upholding it. Um, so I, I haven't arrived, <laughs> but I guess I don't think I will ever arrive. I, I still do harm. I do less harm. I have very good repair skills <laughs> and, and I'm not particularly defensive. And that has earned trust. Not, not that I'm free of racism. People, the people of color in my life who love me don't expect that of me. What, what, what they have come to trust is that they're going to be able to repair. I'm going to be able to repair with them. Right. All right. So young people, the research is very clear that by age three to four, we all know it's better to be white. So the messages of white supremacy are kind of laid into children super young. So to think that you can wait uh, to counter those messages uh, is naive uh, and unproductive. The way that you do it, of course, would want to be age appropriate. Um, but to leave them unattended to that message gives them no ability to resist it, yeah. right? But that's one of the top questions I get when I give a talk from, from white parents. And there's this idea that they, that they could, not having done any work of their own on this, living segregated lives, as most white people do, that they're somehow just going to teach their children something, right? Mm -hmm. Darlene Flynn has the analogy of, being on the airplane and put your oxygen mask on before you turn to the more vulnerable. If, if as a white parent, I'm doing that work on myself, right? Not seeing myself as, oh, oh I understand racism is wrong. I just have to impart that on my child. If instead I recognize this as a process I'm engaged in, it's gonna come through. It's gonna be part of what I talk about, how I, what I notice when we go to a movie, what the conversation's gonna be afterwards. It's gonna be integrated into my life and my parenting. And so it's less a list of do's and don'ts. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. I I'm wondering, like, did you grow up thinking I'm gonna be the white fragility sister? I mean, how yeah. did you get to this point? Was there something <laughs> along the way that kind of pushed you or sparked you? Just can you give us a little insight of how you got here? Yeah, you know, um, I grew up uh, in poverty, and I mean that explicitly. Homelessness, uh, living in our car, uh, foster care. Uh, I didn't go to college until I was in my 30s. I, I, I didn't know I was smart. I, I, you know, uh, the messages I got were uh, dirty, lazy, stupid. Uh, um, and so I, I had a very acute sense at an early age of, of injustice. I'm also female, Catholic. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about the injustices I experienced. Now, it wasn't until I was in 30, my 30s that I ever considered how I colluded with somebody else's injustice and how I benefited from it. And how, in fact, being white shaped how I experienced poverty and how I got out of poverty, right? That, that intersection. Um, so I think having, having an understanding of oppression at a personal level that I could draw from, but not using that to exempt myself. A, a lot of white feminists use sexism as a way out of looking at racism when it's a potentially incredible way in, right? Not that it's the same, but when I can't figure out a piece of racism, let's say you've given me some feedback on, on my racism or you know unaware assumption I was making and I'm feeling defensive about it. All I do is change the roles in my head. And I imagine that I've just given that same feedback to a man about his sexism. And generally, oh my God, I get it. You know, and he tells me I don't feel safe, right? <laughs> yeah, I know how I'd react to that. So um, that gives me an idea of how that's working in the other direction, right? Mm -hmm. That helps um, building relationships across race. I mean, white people's lives are not set up for us to have relationships. And I'm going to say something that for me is really powerful. My life was set up so that it would seem to be more valuable for me not to know and love you than it would for me to know and love you. In other words, the measure of the status of my, of my neighborhood, my workplace, my school, my career would be in part measured by you not being in it. Mm. 
man, like that's so deep. It's so heartbreaking, right? And you can't, you don't know that until you actually begin to have those relationships. And I only had them because I signed up for a job I wasn't applied, uh, um, uh, qualified for. Uh, I was looking for work and I saw an ad for a diversity trainer. And I thought, well, I'm a vegetarian. So of course, uh, <laughs> this joke I often make, right? I can do that. That's all about liberalness, right? That's all about open-mindedness. So I, so I took that job and people of color started challenging me. And so I was a fish being taken out of water. That was part one. Part two was going out side by side with a person of color into almost all white workplaces, trying to talk to white people about racism. Whoa. I mean, you've been there. The hostility is jaw dropping. So it was like this parallel process of being challenged by people of color and then trying to talk to white people. Most white people never have either of those experiences, right? We don't, we don't really have authentic relationships. And I'm just gonna say it, and especially not with black people. Black people, anti-blackness is kind of the ultimate other right? And we certainly are taught not to talk about race and racism. And I started doing it for a living and I started being transformed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm wondering, uh, well, I'm assuming because I hear this question in the mix of practitioners, consultants, is the role or the question of white people making money off diversity. <laughs> So what, what's, what are the ways you respond when you're possibly are questioned, challenged around making money off diversity? Yeah, um, a few different thoughts um, in no particular order. One, I'm really clear I gave my work away for years and years, right? There's a kind of dues that I, that I have paid to be here, right? I get emails from people that say, oh, I went to uh, my first talk and it was so interesting. How do I get into this business, right? I mean, and I have a real problem with that. So this, this is 20 years of a commitment, right? Mm -hmm. Two, um, we could say that I make my, my living off of anti-racism, not racism. And that um, I, I just think it's interesting if I wasn't challenging racism, I, was, I wrote a best-selling book on child psychology and never acknowledged the difference that race makes in a child's psychological development. Nobody would stand up and say, I wanna know what you're doing with your money, right? But when you name race as you should, then you get that question, right? Um, so I, I can't not use this platform or this position. So I try to do it as accountably as I can. I donate a percentage of my income to racial justice organizations um, led by people of color. I have people of color in my life who uh, have agreed to coach me and talk through things with me and I pay them for their time. Um, if they uh, say, no, we're friends, I'm not, I don't, you don't need to pay me for my thinking. Then I say, okay, well, I'm donating for the hour we just spent, you know. Um, promoting the work of people of color, uh, working with people of color. I mean, I, I've got, I can go down the list, but those are some of the ways that I reconcile. Yeah, that's, that's helpful because I, I, I can imagine that this question will continue as we keep um, doing this work. And you mentioned um, people coming up to you saying, well, how do I become Robin D'Angelo, right? Like, how do I become a public speaker or a consultant? Um, so what's your advice, just in general, to anybody who may be listening and wanting to do this work? Yeah, I mean, I can, I, I think you can imagine that I kind of try to bring them down a few notches when they're just thinking that they can do that. But it's like somebody who genuinely is. Yes. Um, then you, you have to start getting engaged with your own work. So I'm a deep believer in affinity groups. You need to be part of affinity groups, maybe eventually facilitate affinity groups. You need to be in every uh, cross-racial dialogue you can be in. You need to attend every conference. You need to uh, get involved uh, in relationships with people across race, right? You, you have to kind of uh, submerge uh, yourself in this um, work and, 
set up w ways to be accountable, right? Um, people often ask me, well, how am I going to know about, you know, racism if I don't ask people of color? It's like, if you have authentic, sustained relationships across race, you actually don't have to ask people of color what their experience is. If you're in relationship with them, you'll see it, you'll feel it. Uh, it'll come through in, if they trust you and what they talk about with you, right? Um, but there are people of color who are willing to teach us, but they get paid for that and should get paid for that. Right. So that, that's, you know, just get as much of your own challenge as you can and then begin to speak about it and begin to build your skills in helping other white people see this. And that goes back a little bit to the question of you can't get this right by everybody. I, I understand that there are people of color who don't even think white people should talk about racism, much less be paid. And clearly, I don't agree with that or wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. But many have said, you need to work with your people. And I, I see what I'm doing as kind of tilling the soil or softening the soil, because I'm sure you've noticed that white people, the things that I can get away with saying are, are kind of incredible to me, hmm. right? That you would not get away with quite as easily, right? So let me get in there and say that hard stuff and open them up a little bit because they're going to hear it more openly from me uh, and then uh there's more room for you to be able to be heard right yeah yeah well speaking of things you can say that i can't say i want to ask you about white women oh yeah um there's um just been and i think needed some conversation about the specific role of white women in social justice particularly as we look at let's say the next 25 years uh, so I'm wondering first, what's your sense of the state of white women around doing this work, uh, social justice, equity, privilege? I mean, if you had to give a grade to the role that white women have played in fighting or, or pursuing justice versus upholding white supremacy, what would be your sense? What, how are you feeling about the role they played up thus far? Yeah, you know, I kind of see like these these rings and rungs, right? Because white women are the most represented in this field. There are very few white men. And I think kind of the higher you are on the on the hierarchy, the less uh, kind of investment you have in inequality, right? So you don't see a lot of white men. But I totally get that if I started seeing a lot of white men uh, getting accolades, I'd feel resentment, right? I mean, I, I get that that's in there for people of color around you know what I get and what I receive, right? So the next kind of layer on the, in the rings is white women, right? We have some in with understanding patriarchy and sexism, but we're still white. Um, and that sets up, you know, white feminism, the centering, right? The, the resentment that white women feel about patriarchy can, can cause us to um, want to constantly change the subject or talk about, you know, all women and this type of thing. So what would I say? I mean, I, I'm in a white women's group and I love dearly and I, and I know that you love these women. So there's potential. Um, I, I don't know that you would be talking to me if you didn't respect me on some level, right? So, um, so this is why it's a mix. Right, it's a mix. Um, oh boy, what would I give us? I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, I just well, that scene in Malcolm X where the white woman runs up to him and says, "What can I do? What can I do?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm well, wondering you, have all those that you in that scene, a white woman, young white, you know, I mean, who's interested? Who wants to be on board? Yeah. Um, you know, just wondering, just off the top of your head, if there's one or two things you would say, here's what you need to do. That could be different than just becoming a diversity consultant or yes. just learning about, you know, being more open and inclusive. But as a white woman, here's what I would suggest. Well, right. So I'll, I'll have to do this is a great example is imagine a man, you know, I've given this talk about misogyny and rape culture and all this and a man rushes up to me and says I want to help you yeah it would be like well there'd be two words that would come up and I'm not going to say them you know just like that's so patronizing and condescending and from your position you're going to help me what I would say 
you know, look at yourself. You can help me by working on your own, uh, you know, misogyny and talking to your brothers and getting out there and doing your work. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would say. There's, there's someone who rushes in to help you. Not only is that condescending, you know, and benevolent, you know, savior stuff, but it assumes that they, they're, they're on the level ground and you're down here and they're going to help you get here but they're not looking that they're here and that it's manifested in even the way that they're reacting to you. So I always consider that it's you that is causing that daily pain. Right. And so if it's you, right, you're the one that's sending your coworker home every day, having to agonize about whether it's worth it to talk to you. That's not the, your friend over there. That's you just assume it's you and then get to work trying to uncover how it's you. And I, I just think it will come through more that way than thinking I'm doing something for you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, speaking of you, how are you doing during this COVID-19, this quarantine? And what's your sense being there in the uh, uh, Pacific Northwest, Seattle area? What's your sense of how the community, how Washington is doing as we're you know dealing with still this kind of uh, shelter in place? Uh, it, it's, it's overwhelming. And um, I've been listening to Kimberly Crenshaw's, she has a series, um, and they're, they've been using the term disaster white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. How the forces that be use um, events like this to accelerate the racist project. Right. And, and so that is so, so loud and it, it's devastating and, and kind of overwhelming and hard to kind of hold up some some hope um, <laughs> that this isn't giving, uh, again, the powers that be much more opportunity. Uh, then there's this the devastation it's wreaking on people's lives. Right. Um, personally, um, I, I'm deeply disappointed not to be out there doing the work and speaking. Um, and so trying to do that in other ways, I don't feel comfortable um, doing webinars and things that I would charge people money for, not at this time and not in this context. And so I'm going to be doing a fundraiser, hundred percent, the proceeds after production go to communities of color, hardest hit. And um, it'll be a dialogue with Resma Minicum. Um, and he, he specializes in racial trauma. He's a black man who specializes in racial trauma and it's called COVID-19, um, and racial embodiment. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're offering that. Um, and if, if anybody's interested, it's coming up next week. <laughs> so education for racial equity.com will have the, it'll be on my um, website too. Just trying to get that, that awareness out to, you know, Yes, it amplifies power and how power takes advantage, but it's also amplifying inequality and people being able to see that and get us out of denial. Um, so let's marshal that for, for good. So you mentioned the webinar. What else is on the horizon? What are you going to be when you grow up, Robin? <laughs> well, what's on the horizon? The next 10 years, as you look at your work and your involvement with the work, um, is there something you're excited about, excited about, something you're working on? What's, what can we expect over the next 10 years? Well, I'm excited about the book I'm working on right now that's a follow-up to White, uh, White Fragility, which is called Niceness is Not Courageous, mm. How Well-Intended White Progressives Uphold Racism. It's very particular to white progressives. Um, and just continuing to, to speak and write uh, on this, probably, um, of, I, I'm kind of peaking in all of this later in life, right? I, I'm in my early 60s. It's kind of blowing my mind. I didn't ever expect to be here, um, but I am here. And so eventually, probably moving to doing that more um, virtually, maybe, maybe mentoring up other, other white folks. I kind of am attached to the way that I do it and want, I want white folks not to copy or, or, you know, learn how to do my slides, but to find their own way of articulating, you know, what they understand. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we did a little white privilege conference in Toronto and it was just nice to see some 
kind of global attention being play, paid and received around this issue. Uh, what's your sense of the global response to white fragility? Yeah, well, my book has been published in six languages. Hmm. And I've had interest from, you know, New Zealand, Australia, Brazil, Netherlands, Portugal, uh, and so on. Um, and, you know, everywhere I go, first of all, um, white people pull me aside and say, it's different here. You know, you don't know the background, you know, racism is American problem, all that. And everywhere I go, it's people of color that brought me who have taken me aside and say, dear God, get over here and help us. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you're, you know, it's a slight tweaks, you know, uh, on the context, but everything you're describing is what we're experiencing. Mm. So when I speak internationally, I just open with that. Like, let's just preempt this nonsense that I don't know, you know, your context, therefore it's not relevant. Of course, I don't know your exact con context. That's on you, right? To, you know, put a little effort into to do the translation. But I am describing something that's universal because white supremacy is global. We exported this globally. It circulates globally. Mm -hmm. And is the response to the young people kind of that millennial generation? Because I sometimes feel people think um, this this um, new generation is going to do it better or bring better results. Um, so when you think about that here in America, the millennials, um, um, what's your sense of that here, but also globally? What, what's been your experience as you encountered uh, stay woke culture, so to speak, yeah. in the 2030 somethings? Yeah, um, I absolutely do not think younger generations are less racist. No way. Um, there are some differences. It, it, it's almost like they have virtual relationships with people of color, so they believe they have authentic relationships. In other words, um, I love this um, musician or this um, athlete. I, I have a poster in my bedroom. And so I have a relationship, but, but not actually in their own lives do they have true relationship, right? So there's kind of a false sense of comfort. And what I have found, uh, I did a, a year of work with a large tech company where really almost everyone is under 30. And one, they could not answer the question, what does it mean to be white? And if you can't answer that question, you, you don't have any skills, you have no analysis, and you are likely have no emotional capacity to, to, to engage with any, you know, authenticity, right? So that means all those people of color working in those overwhelmingly white millennial spaces are, are working with white people who are clueless about racism. Mm. And that, that means they may be friendlier, but, but they can't go there with them. And that means those people can't be their authentic selves. So when we would do these workshops and the people of color would testify, well, there were two dynamics. One is the people of color had never in their lives had anybody articulate or validate internalized racism. So my co-facilitator is a black woman and she laid that out and it was like, like you know, the lights going on of what you have felt, but you, you, nobody's telling you it's happening. So you, you just think there's something wrong with you. So you have this generation of young people of color that also don't have a critical consciousness, you know, not across the board, but you know, in general. And then white people who were flabbergasted when they would share with the, when their coworkers of color would share the pain they were in. Mm. They had no idea which means they have just no awareness and no skill. So, and then, you know, all young people are exposed to straight up old school racism also. Right, you, you, I know you know Joe Fagan. Oh yeah. oh yeah. And he's got that study of just like unbelievable racism that young people share and, you know, so it's kind of like, it's, it's the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, front stage, backstage. Yep. Project Joe and Leslie did. Uh, let me ask you to model the answer to this question. Uh, what is it like to be white? <laughs> to be white, okay, uh, in a way is to never have to bear witness 
to the pain of racism um, on people of color in general and to be never held accountable for the pain that you have caused people of color. Like, I, I just want to lead with that. Um, it's, it's to have internalized a sense of your idealness, your superiority, your uniqueness, your specialness in a context where other people don't get to have that. And you, you not being aware of that causes you to be incredibly hurtful and insensitive, right? So some of the things I articulate about, articulated about white fragility are what it means to be white. Right, to see ourselves as special, but also see ourselves as representative of all of humanity. Therefore, we're objective, it can speak for all of humanity. You know, and as I say those things, then you just imagine, and so what's that like for people who don't get to speak for humanity? To, to have people who are so um, stunted be held up at, at, as the credible authoritative voice. You know, I often wonder, Eddie, if people of color aren't scratching their heads at the mediocrity that white people get away with. So I'll just ask you, <laughs> right? It, it's getting to get away with mediocrity uh, in a society that, that says meritocracy, right? It's, it's all of that coming together uh, and then exuding out of our pores uh, with no awareness and no ability to to get feedback on it. Yeah. Well, what I was wondering as I get towards the end, I got uh, one more kind of uh, about the work question and then a fun question I want to end with. Um, and I want to just ask you to think about that same question during these last 30 to 40, 50 days. Because uh, I think uh, COVID-19 um, quarantine, to some extent, it's a different time. It, this pandemic is unlike what I remember ever experiencing, and even maybe even my mom experienced in reference to life in the US. But if you had to answer that question during COVID-19 quarantine, as a white, white person, what's it like? What has it been like for these last, uh, depending on what state you're in, maybe 30, 40, 60 days, depending on when you started shelter in place? Has it been different? If you had to define what it's like to be white for the last 30, 40, 60 days, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I think what it highlights is, is the insular um, bubble that we live in as white people. Um, how disconnected we are to, to other people's humanities. And so it comes out in um, an assumption that everybody's having a shared experience, right? So all this like goofy things to do when you're home, stuck at home, right? Um, here's how to cook and make crafts. It, it's just the assumption that everybody's just perfectly fine sitting at home, um, that nobody's sick, that nobody has to work. Uh, the people that do have to work are heroes, not, you know, not disposable. Um, and, um, yeah, I see, it, I see it coming through in this, this assumption of, of a shared experience mm. that, that we aren't having, right? I, I'm thinking about Martha Stewart, who just did an interview where she said she's um, kept her, her um, help, which are people of color, and she called them my detainees, ha-ha. They want to go home, but they can't. So, um, I mean, that's kind of, for me, an ex more extreme egregious form, but a taking for granted that there will always be people to serve us, right? And, and, and we can always talk about it in a way that hides structural <laughs> risk. So we can say things like, we're all in this together, right? So I guess you see colorblindness, you see all of these things that are always circulating, just really amplified and, and becoming very clear. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, thank you for that. That's really helpful and hopefully um, allowing people to think about that broader question of what it's like, but also just in this uh, quarantine time, which I'm just still coming to grips of what social distancing even means okay. and how that's different for people, how they're experiencing that differently. And the results of, of course, um, COVID-19, this pandemic, and 
the healthcare implications. I mean, I just think there's so much going on and you are so right in saying that it feels like whoever is articulating what we're doing, what is happening, it just seems so narrow. And even if it's incompetent, it seems to be okay. Right, right. Um, it's, speaking of privilege, uh, I, I, it never occurred to me that there would be any issue around wearing a mask. Right. I just was like, oh, I'm going to make some masks. And I got all kind of pretty material and made masks. Right? I just it was not in my this is I do this for for my life. Right. Uh, this work of uh, being involved in anti-racism never occurred to me that you may not put on a mask and be as relaxed or think it's funny. Uh, right. I can just take so much for granted. Mm. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. Let's end with a little. Um, what are you doing to watch, to read, to listen to during um, quarantine? Is there anything you've been watching, you've been reading, you've been listening to that you would recommend that either teaches folks or challenges folks or just gives folks a chance to just disconnect? Well, in terms of um, the education folk, I mean, there's, there's so much good stuff, as there always is. If you, if you can break through the white apathy and go put out some energy to look it up, there's like so many good webinars and people are offering courses and classes and things. So there's that. Um, and then there's Netflix. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to say it. I do notice how white Ozark is. And I freaking love Ozark. I finished <laughs> the whole thing. I drank it down. Um, Unorthodox, I, I, have you seen it? Uh, that's one of the ones I am recommending, yes, is Unorthodox. Gotta see it, and I think it because it's, it takes place in Williamsburg, so I'm just yeah. curious about, about that. Um, I have been sewing. I rearranged all my memorabilia and photo albums from the um, garage. <laughs> um, and I'm writing, I'm just writing a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well. I appreciate you giving us some time and talking to us a little bit about you and your work. And of course, um, as you mentioned, since you've showed up at White Privilege, you've always been supportive of me and the conference. And I just wanna uh, say to you, as long as you'll be a partner, we'll keep partnering with you. And um, uh, please take care of yourself there in uh, the Pacific Northwest and, um, Thank you for your time, Robin D'Angelo. Yeah, I love you, Eddie. Thank you for the honor. All right, take care. Peace. Appreciate you.